Howdy, and welcome to the show. Cooper's Code examines a legal issue and hits the highlights so we all achieve the best results for our clients. I'm Miles Cooper, and welcome to part two of Jim Brosnahan. Jim, a while back in our conversation, I said there were two avenues that I wanted to go down when you talked about your first case and it being a death penalty murder case. I thought of that case. I also thought of another case, and this involves the Born Innocent trial. And the reason I bring these cases up are these are cases where it is evident that you want to do the best you can for your client, whether it's the people or the Hollywood producers who created Born Innocent. And at the same time, the person on the other side of that V is a human being. And the cognitive challenges that come with taking on those situations. How did you balance those situations? I think that's very well put because since my desire is trial any trial, you could have some listeners who say, well, he doesn't stand for anything and as far as trials. I'm like, God, what is he doing? And I was trial counsel and we had First Amendment counsel from New York, the leading free speech lawyer in the country, basically, Floyd Abrams. And here's what happened. The network, I don't need to mention their name, ran a movie. The movie tells the story about a young teenage girl who didn't commit a crime but ran away from home. And she's put in a juvenile institution where there are very tough young ladies who have committed crimes. There's a shower scene. She's in the shower. She is raped. It's pretty close to showing it. But there's a little bit of a suggestion as to exactly what happened. Not a little bit. It's clear what happened to her. She's violated. Three days later, and Baker Beach in San Francisco, a group of teenage toughs perform a very similar attack on a young girl. No names on any of this. And I was teaching in Colorado, and the general counsel called me and asked if he could come out. I thought, wow, this, is, this must be something. And he told me about the case and asked me if I would do it. I said I would. And we did. And um, the story's in the book. I had handled, it wasn't accidental, I'd been handling First Amendment cases since my days at Cooper White and Cooper and then at Morris and Forrester. I probably handled, let's say, 30 or maybe even 40 First Amendment cases for newspapers, magazines, and all of that. I love that issue. So that was the general counsel knew of my background in, in that. And I had lectured and I had written law review articles on the First Amendment. It's one of my great interests. I'm about to read a book about Justice Holmes and, and uh, other U.S. Supreme Court and how he changed his First Amendment approach. So that's what we did, and it's in the book. The question that I was aiming at at the risk of being too personal or too invasive. And I'll, I'll use an example from my own background. When shortly after our first child was born, our office, and at that time I was working for Ron Ruta with a, a woman named, named Cynthia McGuinn, we ended up getting a case which was a trundle bed death. It was a three-year-old who had been put up to bed for a nap and the trundle bed was either a, like a big drawer or a spot for a mattress and they had left it as a drawer and the three-year-old had put some barrettes in there for her hair and had gotten out of bed and had tried to get them out and had ended up positionally asphyxiated as a result of the design of the trundle bed. And the parents found her blue and unresponsive 45 minutes later when they went up to check on her. I couldn't work on that case and I asked to be removed from that case because... I couldn't talk about that case without getting choked up. And I wouldn't have had that problem before I had a child. And what I was driving at when I was asking about the Born Innocent trial was obviously what happened to the, the young girl at Baker Beach was terrible. And you had clients who you represented and represented successfully. And in the other case, the capital murder case, they didn't put 
the boys to death, but they're juveniles who now might still be in prison. Yes. Those are decisions that a lawyer makes in terms of taking on a case and they have impact. And my question for you is how have you balanced that impact? Do these cases ever come back to you? Well, I balanced it this way. I think if a case goes to trial, there ought to be, and there usually is two strong arguments, one on either side, that as a lawyer, and young ones in law school, they worry about this, but you're the lawyer. You're not the client. People in Northern Ireland confuse that terribly with lethal effect. But, uh, and we do that here in the United States. So a person, a corporation is entitled to a defense. Now, lest you think that I am amoral in the extreme, I refused to represent a gun manufacturer. And that goes back to the Kennedys and their family, which they're, they're also in the book. And uh, my admiration for them, and my father's admiration for them, my grandfather's admiration for them in, the, in Boston. And uh, it's a, that's a long story. But my phone rang one day. The Giants were thinking about moving. And on the phone was the general counsel to a group in Tampa Bay. They were going to have a ball team. Would I represent them so that they could get the Giants and take them to Tampa? Somewhere in my determined heart to try any case, I have some reservation. I said, hell no, I'm not going to. Are you kidding? I'm not going to do that. It would be like you want to represent Pontius Pilate. I gave a talk in Washington, D.C., and it's it was the subject that is very close to my heart, and I've given it a number of times. And I, and there have been times when I actually did what I was talking about. I used to say this in the firm to the corporate lawyers. I would say, representing despised people is one of the great traditions of Morrison Forrester. And I'm only talking about the civil clients, okay? <laughs> and so I gave a speech in Washington to a group about representing despised people. It's what we do as part of being a lawyer. And I got a call the following Monday. He said, my brother has been arrested for possessing child pornography. I said, I'm not going to. I, I mean, I, we had kids at that point, you know. So I, my answer to the question is what I sometimes tell young lawyers is, it's okay if it's not your case, just what you said. If you're going to have a problem with it, you can't represent them. I think you made a comment about judging you as potentially amoral for taking all comers. Yeah. And the reason I asked the question is, it's evident that you've got a high degree of morality and ethics in the cases that you take and the manner in which you've lived your life. And let me give you an example. While he may have been a despised individual, you chose to represent John Walker Lind at a time where my impression is it put you literally in the gun sites as well as your family. Yeah, that case is not in the book. John's name is not there. And he asked that I not included. I respect that decision. However, there have been cases where we got death threats. It's important for me to repeat, I'm a, of Irish extraction. You do not threaten an Irish American. It's a big tactical error. And this guy called one day and said, his group was thinking about what to do about me. I said, is that right? I said, well, I have a great investigator. I'm really one of the best. And he can find out where you are. And if he finds out where you are, I'll be there. And when I get there, you're not going to like it. Now, how serious are you? Because if you shoot at me, you better get me the first time. Well, that was the last time I heard from him. It's in my nature that I will not have anybody threaten my family or me. And that, I think it is Irish. 
On the morality side of things, I owe a big debt to the Jesuits at Boston College from 1952 to 56. It's not a religious thing with me, but it, it is, I mean, to be basic about it, I've been spending my whole life trying to figure out what is Strahler supposed to do? What are we supposed to do now? Look at where we are. Oh, my. What am I supposed to do? And I think trial lawyers do that every day, all day. I think my defense of trial lawyers is we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. I suspect, given the breadth of your practice and given the opportunities you now have to instruct people, either through NIDA or through talks, that you have some wisdom that you would want to impart to the next generation of trial lawyers. I've been doing some writing and I'm giving some lectures. There's a couple of things. What I noticed in writing the book was that good writers are writing for the audience. That is what lawyers do. You have an audience. You may have a jury. You may have a judge. You may have an arbitrator. If you apply empathy to their problem and you address your arguments to them, knowing as much as you can about them, that's what we do, is try to understand their problem. Imagine a case with, say, President Trump, imagine being a juror. I actually brought with me one one book, and uh, there's another one. At one point in my in my life, I realized that jurors have written books about their experience, and I got two of them. Jury Woman is a book written by a juror, and so when I read that book, I understood their problem. You're trying to help them. You're a teacher. You have three points, and they're not legalese. There are three points, and here it is. So that's number one. Number two, in my class at Berkeley Law, which I taught for 10 years, 40% of the students, when asked, have some reservation about their voices from mild, minor problem, to serious problems. The same experience I've had teaching practicing lawyers. I think people would be amazed that a lawyer that's practiced 20 years has got reservations about their voice. Why? They don't teach in most law schools. They don't teach a course on voice training. It's not that hard to do. I have a list of six qualities of the voice. We practice that. The voice is crucial, and it can be trained, and you practice it. Well, suppose you've been a lawyer for 25 years. You still have to practice your voice, and what you do is you take something you'd like to read anyway, and you take maybe your telephone, you record it, you listen to it. What does that sound like? It's very hard to understand your own voice, but maybe you speak too fast because you're in a hurry and you're going to do all this. Maybe your voice is kind of cranky. That mood thing in courtrooms is crucial. What mood are you conveying? Is that deliberate? Do you have control of your voice? And it's very rewarding. I've taught, I don't know, maybe 2,000 law students and lawyers, voice training, one-on-one often, sometimes in groups, the change is really important. One thing I discovered that there are a couple of professors in this area that are telling women that you should lower your voice to be more authentic and sound like a man. No, absolutely not. Two reasons. Number one, you got to be yourself. That's important. But even more important, baritones don't change to be tenors, basses don't decide they they always wanted to be something else because this mechanism that I'm pointing to here is a very delicate thing. You have to be yourself, so develop your own style. You got to have a style. I thought you were going to say reason number three on uh, women not learning their voice was Elizabeth Holmes. 
Yeah. What happened to me, I became fixated by voices, and I would listen to jurors when they're answering a question. You know, are you in favor of the death penalty? Well, not really. Whoa, time out. The sound of the voice. Witnesses. What are they conveying? The sound of the voice. And clients. Where is this client right now? Based on what they just said. The sound of the voice. And if you look at American business on television, you'll hear some of the best voices around. On the speed component, when I'm in a good cross-exam, I start going so fast. And Cynthia McGuinn taught me, if the court reporter is sweating, <laughs> and now court reporters have word per minute counters, you can go over and ask them, how fast am I going? And if you're going over 120 words per minute, yeah. you're going faster than a human brain can process. As evidence, of, I get to hang out with some of the great lawyers and like yourself and Cynthia. Cynthia McGuinn is one of the best trial lawyers in the country as far as I'm concerned. And what's this all about? You got to have a voice that the jury wants to listen to. It's that simple. That makes a lot of sense. Going back to saying what is so, I want to touch a little bit on Rehnquist and the confirmation hearing, if that's okay. What prompted you to stand up and say what is so, as far as that's concerned? And maybe you can set the stage for us a little bit. Well, we're back to Phoenix. It's 1962. I'm an assistant U.S. attorney, a federal prosecutor, and the boss asked me to be the person in charge of taking complaints about the 1962 election. Routine stuff. So I did, and I was on the desk for that, and I got calls and so forth. I got a call from a school, which was a voting place, in South Phoenix, in a predominantly black American and Hispanic neighborhood. And the complaint was that excessive challenging was going on to the people there. And some people were frustrated. The lines were very long. People had to get to work. And so they were leaving. So I got an FBI agent and we went down to the school and there was Bill Rehnquist. I had my badge, and, you know, and I, this is Mr. Jones with the FBI and so forth, whatever his name was. And that had a calming effect. But I said, well, you know, what's the problem? And they indicated that Mr. Rehnquist, as he then was, was participating in the challenging. Okay, I was satisfied it wouldn't happen again because when you come and show your federal badge, it's amazing what happens, you know. I showed it very rarely, but on that day I did. So I went away, and um, in 1986, I think it was, my phone rang, and it was a reporter, and uh, the voice said, I understand you had a issue with Bill Rehnquist, Justice Rehnquist, as, as he was, he was one of nine, at a polling place. And I said, well, yeah, that's true. And they said, well, you know, they're having the hearings. He's been nominated to be chief justice. And I said, well, okay. But that, uh, what I said was, that's a long time ago. I mean, and I gave the example. I said, Southern politicians have apologized for what what they did, and it's an awful long time ago. And the voice said, have you read his testimony when he went on the court in 1971? And I said, no, I haven't read it. And she said, he denied any involvement or something, something like that. And I said, oh. And the next day, I received a call from a staff member of the Judiciary Committee repeated the conversation, and I was asked if I would come be a witness. I had then read the testimony, and I said, if I'm subpoenaed, I will. When I was, I don't know, 20, 
I walked around neighborhoods in Boston for political people knocking on doors and talking to black Americans who would answer the door. That was part of the Kennedy base. The idea that someone would challenge black Americans and Hispanic Americans in that neighborhood was abhorrent to me. I didn't like it. And it it showed me a side that Bill Rehnquist was, was on. So I was subpoenaed. I went back and the story is in the book. And, uh, you know, I hate to confess this in public here if we were in public, but I had a great time back there. I mean, I just felt like I know what happened and they don't, of course. Political truth and courtroom truth are two different things. And courtroom tells me you better be as accurate as you can. Politicians are not as accurate as they should be. That was fine. And, and, uh, but there's a tagline, and that was, I got another Supreme Court case representing political parties in California. And I went back, and there is Bill Rehnquist, Chief Justice of the United States, sitting in the center row. And there I am, and that story is in the book. It's interesting how small the playing field is when you reach a certain level. Yeah. Recently, I was actually quoted on television. MSNBC did a whole piece tracing what was done by Republicans starting way back, and they mentioned me. It was really Rehnquist that was the center of the story. But that process, Republicans have done the last election they were in Georgia. They were closing polling booths and uh, making it harder and harder to vote. So that's about as un-American as I can think of. I would agree. I know you would agree. But it's one of the last things we do with the government. We get to vote. Yeah. I have very much enjoyed our conversation. And before I wrap, I have a couple of things that I I do want to cover with you. If you were to be able to leave one, two, three things as your legacy, what would you want people to remember you for? I think uh, my family. (laughs) I will tell you a story. It's in the book. Uh, Carol's Jewish, and uh, I'm Irish, and... When we were first married, people would ask us, or after the children came, they'd whisper it. They would say, how did you bring up the children? And it, it implied it's impossible, isn't it? You know. And so we started to simply say to people who would raise that question, we fed them Wheaties and we sent them to Berkeley High School. <laughs> and without going on and on and on, our three children, our four grandchildren, that's a legacy. I find it telling that despite the illustrious career that you have had, the first thing that you mention is family. Well, my luck runneth over. Uh, and uh, I was asked the other day by an interviewer who said, well, you balanced work and leisure and, you know, you had this wonderful balance. How did you accomplish that? I said, Carol Brosnahan, Judge Brosnahan, retired. She was always there. She's the same this morning. Um, And uh, she made the transition from the old way of doing things to a, a new way of doing things. And what does happen to you when you get to be older? is certain good things have happened and how they might have gone the other way. If I didn't take a pie that Carol cooked over to her apartment the next day after I told her I could get my own dates, if I didn't do that, my whole life would have been different. So that's the legacy. The other one, though, I would mention is never give up. Don't give up. Just don't. Uh, I used to, about twice a year, I would declare the day bankrupt and go home at 2 o'clock. And then the next day, you go in and you start again. And I've got a couple of losses in the book. What's that like? And 
I think it makes interesting stories. Are there any lawyers, two or three, who you would want to hear from in a similar way that we're listening to you right now? Well, I keep telling my friend John Kecker uh, that he should do a book, and he doesn't want to do a book. Yeah, he's doing other things right now, which are very important in the city of San Francisco, very important. And I have uh, sat and listened to John cross-examine my witnesses. I have been with him on the same side on many occasions uh, where we were working together some pretty exciting cases. And I think John possesses all the skills, the personality, the refined abilities to question and to read the jury and understand about as well as, as anyone I work with, along with Joe Kuchet. The Joe Kuchet is, both of these are in the Bay Area. Joe Kuchet, to me, remembers why he went to law school. He went to reform the whole world, and he's been working on it ever since. Uh, he's contributed so much to society in his efforts, both uh, political and legal, and is recognized properly as one, one of the best. So if I mention those two, I think those would be my favorites. It's interesting because when I was thinking about the few lawyers who I know of who do that civil criminal highline work. John Kecker was one of the other names that I thought of. Yeah. As we reach an end, is there anything else that you think our listeners should know from you? Well, it's very, it's very simple to young people out there thinking about being a lawyer. I will tell you it's a good life. The question is, if you want to be a trial lawyer, do you like competition? It can be any kind of competition. Uh, not just sports or something, but any kind of competition. Do you think that you could live with the fact that you might try a case and, and lose it because people do lose? So that's where the competition comes in. But here's the bottom line. If I ever saw a country, my country, your country, that needs reform in all areas, including, including the law, it is us now. In fact, I've said this to a couple of people. If I could, I would start all over. And I would work on diversity, which is not put the Supreme Court to one side. It's not accomplished at this point the way it ought to be. And I would work on all these things again with the vigor of a young person. And so... The law is a tool for that. The plaintiff's lawyers, the defense lawyers, they see things, they experience the problems. And then, you know, they go to a bar meeting and they propose, they draft a, a statute for the legislature. That happens every day. So those are a couple of thoughts. Anything else? Read the book. <laughs> well, and, and I will say, for anyone who's listening, my eyes are drooping today. The book kept me up later than I intended just because I don't think of a memoir typically as a page turner, but I just kept wanting to see what was happening next. Yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. Jim, thank you for being on today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And I have as well. I really enjoyed our conversation. And thank you for listening today. Please email us at podcast at coopers.law with questions, comments, feedback, and suggestions you have on being the best trial lawyer possible. Like what you heard? Share us with a colleague and leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. To all of you doing justice out there, happy ending.